As promised in the previous 10-minute lecture, Assemblies 101, link below, we'll use that video's assembly as a sub-assembly for today's music box model. And with it, learn about editing assemblies, creating assembly drawings, adding bill of materials tables, and creating motion restrictions. We'll take the lid sub-assembly from that video, bring in a couple of hinge parts, four screws, and the music box base, and put them all together to have a music box case that can open and close its lid. The main goal here is to learn how we can edit a part within an assembly, either by editing the part itself at a part level, or editing a part by adding assembly features to the assembly. We'll open all of the components we'll use, parts and assemblies, before creating a new assembly file, so that our components are readily available from the part slash assembly to insert window, just like it was explained in the previous lecture. Since during the previous lecture we had added the pins to this assembly purely as a practice exercise, but not because we wanted them to be a part of that initial sub-assembly, let's start by removing those first. Under the Mates dropdown, we can check that no mates are dependent on the location of the pins. In fact, the only mates where the pins were used were the last four, so we know that removing them is not going to break our assembly in any way. We click on them and delete them with the Delete key, or selecting Delete within the right-click options, and the confirmation dialog will show up, mentioning what mates and features will be affected by this deletion. In this case, exploded view steps, which of course pertain to moving the pins out of the way while exploding the view. We delete the pin, do the same with the second one, agree to the deletion, and we save the part so that we can bring it into the new assembly. We click on the Insert Components button, and we click on the Push Pin to keep the window from closing as we place new parts in the workspace. We'll bring in the Music Box Base first, since like it was explained in the previous lecture, the first part you bring in will be the fixed frame of reference for everything else. We add the lid assembly, two hinge parts, four screws, and the two pins we just removed from the lid sub-assembly. Notice that in accordance with our main goal, the box base has not been drilled with the necessary holes for the screws to go through, and therefore we need to create those either at a part level or at an assembly level. If the same box is going to be used for another application, it makes sense for the engineer that worked on the box to keep the part as is, and only describe the screw holes at an assembly level. But if this box is only being manufactured to be used with this music box, modifying the original design without holes would be better. To find the best location for the holes, we will begin by mating some of the parts. We know we want the other half of the hinges to be flush with the back of the base. We go to Mate, click on the back of the hinge, click on the back of the base, right click to confirm, and do the same with the other hinge. We probably want those hooks facing up, so to avoid having to flip directions later when mating, we'll rotate them now using the triad. Now we're not gonna keep some of the next few mates, but we'll still create them so that we can align the lid to the base. We go to Mate and use the front face of both the base and the lid, the right side face of both, and finally, the bottom face of the lid and the top face of the base. This guarantees that the lid is perfectly aligned with the base. We want the hooks of the hinges to be concentric, so we add that, and we want the right face of the first hook of the top hinge to be coincident with the left face of the first hook of the bottom hinge. And we repeat this process for the second hinge set. With this, we know exactly where the holes will go. And this is where we have two options. The first one is to simply create an extruded cut at the assembly level. And remember that this is what we would do if we want to keep the part intact. For this option, we would create a sketch on the surface of the base and create circles that are centered with the hole of the hinge and that have the same diameter. Since in this very simplified case, we match the diameter of the holes and the screws. We'll learn more about threaded components in a later video, link below. We exit the sketch, and since we're within an assembly, we don't have the Features tab here by default to find Extruded Cut. However, we can go to Insert, Assembly Feature, Cut, and Extrude. And since the holes on the lid were 0.3 inches deep, we select the Blind option here and set it to 0.3 inches. Even if we save here, if we go back to the model of our base, it will still not have any holes in it. The holes only exist within the assembly when creating them like this. But what if we in fact want the holes to be added to an updated version of the base part? Well, in that case, let's start by getting rid of that extruded cut and the sketch that, as you see here, are part of the assembly only. If we right-click on the part that we want to edit, we can just select the fourth icon that reads Edit Part. 
This will make every other part transparent, which is exactly what we want, because we want to be able to look at our part without the other components blocking the view, but still retain them to reference them to create sketches and features. The process here is very similar. Create sketch on the same surface, draw the same four holes with the same center and radii, and under the now available features tab, use the sketch for an extruded cut of depth 0.3 inches. As soon as we exit the editing part view, the transparency of the other components will disappear, indicating we're back to our assembly home screen. And if we go to the base part model window, we see that it's already been updated to include the holes. We can save here so that our files are up to date. Back in our assembly, we can add mates to align the screws with the new holes, and in this case, as opposed to the previous lecture where we used the top surface of the screw and the outermost surface of the hinge, we'll use the conical surfaces of the head of the screw and the hinge hole to restrict their movement in all three dimensions with only one type of mate. If we only use the outer surface for the mate, like we did during the last video, the hinges and therefore the lid subassembly would still be able to go up and down, piercing through the screws. The last components we add now are the pins. Just like in the previous video, we add a coincident mate for both cylindrical features and the side of the pin and hinge. Now that the entire assembly is completed, we can remove the mates that are restricting the lid from leaving its current position. If we want the lid to open, we obviously have to delete the mate that keeps the horizontal faces together, otherwise the lid is kinda glued to the base. As the lid opens, the back face, or the front face from this perspective, will tilt backwards, which means that we have to get rid of this other coincident mate. And even though we could delete the third of those temporary mates we used to align the lid to the base, since these two surfaces will always be coplanar as the lid opens, we will keep it to make the advanced mate we'll add in a second work properly. Now we have a working lid for this music box. It can open and close while maintaining the hinges in place. However, the components will not interact with each other if we're only dragging them from this home view, meaning that the lid can move through the base. If a certain configuration has intersecting geometries, we can easily check for those by going to Evaluate, Interference Detection, and pressing the Calculate button. This will highlight in red the volume of the components that are intersecting, so always make sure that your assembly configuration does not show interference. To be able to move the parts detecting collisions, we don't just drag the components, but we actually click on the Move Component button, select the Collision Detection option, and check the Stop at Collision box. That way, when we move a component, it will actually stop when trying to go across another component. Another option here is to add an advanced mate. That way, you don't need to go into the Move Component option for a specific part. To create an advanced mate, we go into Mate, click on the Advanced tab, and in this case, create a relationship between the two surfaces that touch when closed to give it a range of angles between them. The minimum being 0 and the maximum being, let's say we measured this previously, 196.1 degrees. And done! Now our lid can be moved freely without it intersecting the base or having its hinges overlap in the back. And we did this without the need to go into Move Component. We're just dragging the component. The last thing here is the drawings and the Bill of Materials table. If we quickly create an exploded view for this assembly, and check out the previous video where we cover how to do this in detail if you haven't already, and we reuse the exploded view of the subassembly by right-clicking on it and selecting Reuse Subassembly Explode, we can go to File and select Make Drawing from Assembly instead of Make Drawing from Part as we normally do. Here, we drag the views we want, change the scale, change the display style, and for any of the views, we can right-click on them and select Show in Exploded State. Depending on the drawings, you'll want to show that exploded view. And you can dimension anything and everything you need, and even make use of the helper views we learned about a couple videos ago. Link below to that helper views video if you haven't watched it yet. For example, a detail view here. More importantly though is the Bill of Materials, commonly referred to as BOM. To add it, we go to Insert, Tables, and Bill of Materials. We'll learn how to create a template for these later, but for now, we use a template we have and simply place the table on the drawings page. In this template example, you'll see the part number and the part name. We can edit the part's name from within the part by going into File and Properties and creating a property that reads, for example, part slash assembly name and give it a value of hinge and the bomb will update automatically. We can also just edit the bomb directly by double clicking a field. 
SolidWorks will ask you if you want to keep the link, and since we do want this edit to make changes to the part, we select Keep. We write pins, for example, and whatever number we want, and the part will update with those name properties too. To place balloons with the number values that refer to the parts, we go into the Annotation tab and click on Balloon. We click on a component, and then click again to place the balloon itself. This way we get to see which part is which with respect to the bill of materials. If for whatever reason you don't want all parts to show individually, but you want for one of the components to be the lid subassembly, when you go into inserting a bill of materials table, you can select the top level bump type option on the left. Notice that we now have four screws, two hinge parts and a lid assembly instead of eight screws, four hinge parts and one lid like we did before. The links to the other lectures of the SolidWorks course are down in the description below, so make sure to check them out just like the playlists to other engineering courses. Thanks for watching.